I'm I'm not certain that this microphone broadcasts or whether it's just recording. Is, does it broadcast? Great. That's good. My name is Walter Cox. I'm a retired judge from uh, South Carolina and also had the great pleasure of serving on the United States Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces with uh, Robinson O. Everett, who, who when I served was our chief judge. And following that, I had the great pleasure of coming to Duke University and lecturing with Judge Everett in criminal law and, and in military law and other fields. And I eventually uh, got bored being a retired judge and went back practicing law with the law firm of Nelson Mullins Riley in Scarborough. Uh, Nelson Mullins has offices in Raleigh and Charlotte and Winston-Salem, so we do have a, a strong connection in the North Carolina market, although I'm a South Carolinian and in the Charleston office. This is what the fifth year, fourth or fifth year that we, fourth or fifth year that we've presented the Robinson O. Everett White Collar Crime Seminar, and I'm delighted to have all of you here. I'd like to introduce first, though, uh, the Dean of Duke University Law School, Dean Levy. Uh, well, welcome to, to Duke Law School. If you've been walking around the hallways today, you can see what a busy place this is by all the food that's out. You can, you can be on the fourth floor, and I will tell you that at the uh, conference on the mortgage lending conference, there are beef and vegetarian burritos. Um, the, the faculty has wraps. They are hearing a presentation by uh, Professor Joles from the Yale Law School. Um, I just have come from the conference on doing business in Latin America. Uh, you can get some M&Ms outside that room. They're playing salsa music inside, or at least they were until just before I spoke. Uh, so, and, th and this is sort of a typical day at, at the law school. And it's wonderful to have this conference here again the Robinson O. Everett White Collar Crime Conference. Now, Robbie mentioned to me that um, it's not everybody that has a white collar crime conference named for them, and he wanted me to make it clear <laughs> that this is not because of his expertise in the commission of white collar crime. Um, I want to say that with Robbie's uh, expertise in so many different areas of the law that uh, I think there is still time, Robbie, <laughs> and that you may yet acquire that expertise. Um, I was a white collar crime prosecutor and then um, went on the federal court before I um, came to, to Duke Law School. And so this is a, a topic that I consider to be very, very important and uh, I'm grateful to uh, Judge Cox for having the idea for this conference, for naming it um, after my good friend uh, Robbie Everett and for um, inviting all of you here today for such a productive meeting. Thank you very much. Welcome to Duke. Before I introduce our first speaker, a couple of administrative announcements. First of all, we have applied for four hours credit of CLE uh, from the state of North Carolina bar. Uh, one of those hours is uh, we've sought credit for ethics. I did that about three or four weeks ago and had expected to have heard from them, but apparently the board hadn't met yet, so I haven't gotten word. But I, it's been approved every other year, so I feel comfortable that, that you're going to be able to get credit. So. Uh, the second thing is if you're from out of state and would like to get credit, I, I'll be delighted to provide a certificate of attendance and just be sure you give Doris Kelly your name and address and, and that you need that and I'll be sure to get that. Uh, the food that we're going to serve is Milky Ways and Reese's Buttercups. Uh, I don't know where they are, but they're right here somewhere. <laughs> Our first speaker uh, who has supported us in every one of these conferences is uh, the Honorable Carl Horn, who is a United States Magistrate Judge down in the, in the Western District of North Carolina and lives in Charlotte. And Judge Horn has taken a great interest in legal education. He's written books uh, helpful to attorneys. One of them uh, is particularly valuable on on the life, having a good life as a profession that, that uh, I've recommended to my colleagues. But he keeps up and keeps abreast of developments in criminal law in the Fourth Circuit, in particular in the United States Supreme Court. So Judge Horn, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Thank Quit. you, Walter. Sure. Greetings, everyone. It's an, it's an honor to do anything that uh, is named after Judge Everett and that Walter Cox has anything to do with planning up. This um, year I have summarized for you in the, I think it's a yellow cover, 
um, materials, the decisions uh, in, from the Supreme Court and the published Fourth Circuit opinion since our last seminar. Uh, basically, um, January 1, actually a little before our last seminar, January 1 of 2007 through March 31st of this year. The uh, first uh, nine pages of the materials basically explain uh, the format. Uh, I follow the same order that I follow in, in the book, so I have the uh, table of contents uh, reproduced uh, that we don't have, of course, uh, each of these issues addressed in the opinions that we'll be talking about, but if they are addressed, they are listed uh, in that order. Our first uh, case notes uh, begin on page 10 of your materials, and it is a Franks hearing issue. Most of you know that if a defendant makes a substantial preliminary showing that a false statement, knowingly or intentionally, or with reckless disregard for the truth, was included in an affidavit in, su in support of a search warrant, or that there was a knowing or intentional material omission, either of which would alter a finding of probable cause, a Franks hearing must be conducted. The case, uh, United States versus Blatstein, uh, involved a defendant podiatrist who billed his patients for surgery in non-existent uh, pre-operation holding rooms, operating rooms, and recovery rooms for procedures, uh, in, including removing ingrown toenails, if they were performed at all, were actually performed in his office. Based on statements obtained from prior uh, patients and, em and employees, and certain corroborative documents the government applied for and obtained a search warrant for the defendant's office. The defendant argued that a Franks hearing should have been conducted to determine whether informing the magistrate judge of a particular Virginia statute which allowed or allows surgical procedures in medical offices in certain circumstances might have served to defeat probable cause. The Fourth Circuit concluded to the contrary that the affidavit would have provided probable cause for the search warrants even if it had specified and discussed this statute because it was the defendant's billing practices, not whether he was legally permitted to perform the surgery, which was the subject of the uh, search and the ultimate charges and conviction. Consent to search case, uh, on the next page, U.S. versus Buckner, there, law enforcement received complaints that online fraud was being committed uh, using AOL and eBay accounts opened in the name of Michelle Buckner, the eventual defendant's wife. Responding to the complaints, police went to the Buckner home where only Michelle Buckner was present and spoke with her about the suspect transactions. Mrs. Buckner assured the police that she only used the home computer occasionally to play solitaire and then invited the police to take whatever they needed and was generally cooperative. Pursuant to Mrs. Buckner's oral consent, the police seized the computer's hard drive for forensic analysis. The analysis confirmed the complaints of fraud, albeit by her husband, who was subsequently indicted on multiple wire and mail fraud charges. <coughs> the issue on appeal was whether Mrs. Buckner had actual or apparent authority to consent to the search of Mr. Buckner's password-protected files. <coughs> the Fourth Circuit concluded that Mrs. Buckner did not have actual authority to consent, but that she did have apparent authority. In reaching this conclusion, the court considered the totality of the circumstances known to the police at the time of the seizure, namely that the computer was on when they arrived, uh, though the defendant was not present, that the accounts which were uh, used to perpetrate the fraud uh, and the computer itself, which was leased, were all in Mrs. Buckner's name. And the court noted that the officers did not have any indication from Mrs. Buckner or from any of the attendant circumstances that the files were, in fact, password protected. The court, in so holding, distinguished Trulock versus Free, a 2001 Fourth Circuit decision in which it held that a co-resident of a home and co-user of a computer who did not know the necessary password for her co-user's password-protected files did not have authority, apparent or actual, to consent to the warrantless search of those files. 
the court in Trulock likened the private computer files to a locked box within an area of common authority. Next page, uh, inventory searches. The case is U.S. versus Banks. There the defendant was arrested and ultimately charged in a prescription drug fraud scheme which involved creation of fictitious medical clinics on which fraudulent prescriptions were written using the names and DEA numbers of legitimate area physicians which were then filled at different area pharmacies. When the defendant was initially arrested at a pharmacy where a co-conspirator had just unsuccessfully attempted to pick up a fraudulent prescription, he asked the arresting officer to bring two black bags from his vehicle to the police station. When the bags were opened at the station, an abundance of incriminatory evidence was discovered. The issue in Banks was whether the district judge erred in denying the defendant's uh, motion to suppress, which the Fourth Circuit answered in the negative. The court concluded that this was a proper inventory search, which it defined as an incidental administrative step following arrest and preceding incarceration, conducted to protect the arrestee from theft of his possessions, the police from false accusations of theft, and to remove dangerous items from the arrestee prior to his jailing. The court noted that inventory searches must be conducted according to standardized policy and procedures to prevent them from being utilized as a ruse for a general rummaging in order to try to discover incriminating evidence. In this case, the, uh, the court found that that had occurred. A Bruton issue, uh, beginning on uh, top of page uh, 13 in U.S. versus Allen. There, the defendant argued that incriminating company documents obtained by subpoena from a non-testifying co-defendant who authored the documents violated Bruton. Of course, Bruton prohibits the evidence of out-of-court statements uh, by a non-testifying co-defendant. And, and held that uh, in the 1968 Supreme Court decision that such would violate the Confrontation Clause. The Fourth Circuit disagreed with the defendant, reasoning that the jury wasn't told that the documents were produced or authored by the co-defendant. Rather, the link between the documents and the two defendants was proven through other means, such as uh, testimony regarding the handwriting and telephone numbers on faxes. Because the jury was not told that the co-defendant produced the company documents, the court concluded they could not probably be considered the co-defendant's statements, and therefore there was no Bruton violation. Right to counsel decision, this is a Duke, uh, the district judge in this case is a Duke Law uh, grad, uh, Judge Graham Mullen in, in the Western District, U.S. versus Balcom, and I, I handled the pretrial part of this case. There, the defendants were tax protesters who believed the federal tax system was unconstitutional and wished to have counsel who shared their views. Uh, their technique for seeking counsel of choice was to send lawyers lengthy questionnaires and invite them to apply for that privilege. Uh, in the third or fourth uh, inquiry to counsel proceeding, I asked them, well, how many have returned, how many have you sent? And it was some close to 100. I said, how many have been returned? And they said, none. <laughs> well, despite numerous continuances over a 15-month period and appointment for a brief time of standby counsel, the defendants ultimately went to trial pro se. The defendants argued on appeal that the district judge's refusal to grant another continuance was a violation of their Sixth Amendment right to counsel. The Fourth Circuit acknowledged <clears throat> that the Constitution generally entitles a defendant to representation by counsel of choice, which may be violated when the district court refuses to continue a trial, despite the fact that the defendant does not have counsel or when the counsel is unprepared. But the uh, Fourth Circuit ultimately concluded that this was not such a case. Drug distribution by a medical doctor, page 14, U.S. versus Short. You've read about this case, I, I suspect. There, the defendant was a medical doctor in Columbia, South Carolina, charged in a 43-count uh, bill of indictment for distributing steroids and human growth hormones to uh, a number of uh, professional athletes, including Carolina Panthers, to enhance their performance. The defendant dispensed uh, the steroids and growth. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a good point. <laughs> 
Um, the, uh, <laughs> actually, it, was, it wasn't this year. Um, the, the, the defendant dispensed the steroids and growth hormones in different forms and manners to those uh, who were subject to testing and specifically counseled athletes who were described as flying in from all over the country how to avoid detection. The sentencing guidelines in effect at the time recommended a zero to six month uh, sentence. Uh, Chief Judge Joseph Anderson, South Carolina, determined that a slightly higher sentence was appropriate and sentenced the defendant to a term of 12 months and one day. The issue on appeal was whether the variant sentence was reasonable. The Fourth Circuit found that it was, citing the length and national <coughs> scope of the criminal conduct, the defendant's aggressive and cavalier attitude, the protracted perversion of the defendant's medical expertise, the subversion of professional sports as an institution, and the fact that professional athletes serve as role models for the young. The Fourth Circuit's conclusion that the variant sentence was reasonable was reinforced by two additional points. First, the court noted that the sentencing guidelines governing distribution of steroids had since been amended and in their current form would have recommended a range of 15 to 21 months imprisonment rather than zero to six. And second, uh, as a part of our national culture, the court concluded that professional sports are sufficiently influential and visible that an overly lenient sentence would understate the seriousness of the offense and undermine the respect for law. Mail fraud, uh, the Delfino decision, also on page uh, 15. There, the defendants challenged the sufficiency of the evidence, arguing that the government had not proven that they used an interstate commercial carrier. To sustain a conviction for mail fraud, the government must prove two things, the existence of a scheme to defraud, one, and second, the use of the mails or another interstate carrier for the purpose of executing the scheme. However, there's a great deal of flexibility in how this second uh, element may be proven, including through evidence of business practice and office custom. In Delfino, the Fourth Circuit found sufficient testimony by a loan officer that he had no direct memory or knowledge of the receipt of the defendant's loan application, that he did not have any direct knowledge as to whether it was received by mail or commercial carrier, but that the, cover, the company's normal business practice was to send the borrower a return United Parcel Service or Federal Express envelope, which the borrower then typically uses to return the application. Wire fraud decision, United States versus Allen. Uh, there, the defendant secured what were in reality general business loans, falsely informing the lenders that the funds were being used to lease new computer equipment. Customers were instructed to tell the lenders falsely that they had received the computers if they were called for verification and prior to any on-site inspection were provided labels with serial numbers to affix to existing computer equipment. Over the course of the scheme, the loss amount was approximately $1.7 million. The defendants argued that the evidence did not establish that they possessed the requisite intent to commit fraud because they believed the loans would be repaid. The Fourth Circuit disagreed, describing the intent to repay as irrelevant to the question of guilt for fraud. The court found that the defendant's argument was particularly dubious in light of their practice of telling borrowers how many payments they should make uh, so they would not be red flagged. Securities fraud, page 17, United States versus jo uh, Johnson. There, the defendant was charged in the Eastern District of Virginia with filing a false and fraudulent document with the Securities and Exchange Commission, agreeing that the presence of the SEC's computer server was insufficient to establish venue. Uh, the district judge granted the defendant's motion to dismiss that count. The Fourth Circuit reversed holding first that electronic transmission of the documents, which was directed by the SEC to the server in the prosecuting district, was sufficient to establish venue in that district. Second, that while the defendant did not know the SEC would route the data to its server in the Eastern District of Virginia, he still caused the offending information to be stored in that district. And third, that it was not necessary to show that a defendant could have reasonably foreseen that the false information would be routed to a particular district 
for venue to be proper. Three decisions uh, on tax crime, involving tax crimes, two Fourth Circuit decisions, and one Supreme Court decision. This is Balkum, the tax protester case I've, I've spoken of uh, in regard to the right to counsel. Uh, there, the defendants were tax protesters. Uh, they were convicted of failing to file federal tax returns. At sentencing, the district court excluded from relevant conduct all unpaid state taxes, and for some not altogether clear reason, five of the 12 years of unpaid federal taxes. The Fourth Circuit reversed, finding that the defendant's failure to file state taxes uh, or tax returns was part of the same course of conduct or common scheme or plan, the classic definition of relevant conduct. The Fourth Circuit also assumed that the district court on remand would include the federal tax losses from all 12 years in calculating the applicable guidelines range. The Fourth Circuit also found in allowing an acceptance of responsibility reduction, the court had erred. The Fourth Circuit agreed with the government that the narrow exception allowing a reduction for acceptance of responsibility after a trial, that is where the defendant goes to trial to assert a legal right or position not to contest factual guilt, did not apply here because the uh, defendants had contested willfulness, which is a factual issue. Bottom of page 18, U.S. versus Delfino. There the defendants, a married couple, followed the counsel of a self-described tax, <coughs> tax consultant by establishing trusts to which they then channeled their income, allegedly believing that this relieved them of any obligation to pay income taxes the defendants did not file tax returns or pay income tax for over 10 years, nor did the Delfinos cooperate with an IRS audit, which began eight years before they were charged criminally. Based on these facts, the jury found the defendants guilty of tax evasion and conspiracy to defraud the United States. On appeal, the defendants argued that the district court abused its discretion by disallowing the testimony of others who had established trust based on the advice of the same tax consultant, that is to establish a good faith defense, and secondly, that the tax loss was incorrectly calculated by failing to reduce estimated taxable income by deductions to which they would have been entitled had they filed tax returns. Regarding the exclusion of witnesses who had established similar trust, the Fourth Circuit held that the district court acted within its discretion noting that the witnesses proffered by the Delfinos were not parties to the same presentation as the Delfinos, and the Delfinos had had no contemporaneous knowledge of these participants when they had set up their trust and evaded uh, their income tax obligations. The Fourth Circuit also agreed with the government that tax loss was properly calculated without regard to any deductions the defendant may have been entitled to if they had filed returns. Acknowledging that U.S. v. Smith, a 1991 Fourth Circuit uh, decision had held to the contrary, the court concluded that changes to the uh, guidelines, specifically Section 2T1.1C1, uh, since then had made, uh, had in, effect, in effect overruled the holding in Schmidt. The Supreme Court uh, decision involving a tax crime is uh, Boulware v. United States, which is reported beginning on page 20 of your materials. There the defendant uh, was convicted of four counts of tax evasion and five counts of filing materially false tax returns. At trial, the government's evidence focused on the diversion of funds from Hawaiian Isles Enterprises, HIE, a closely held corporation which the defendant uh, had founded, was president of, and was the controlling shareholder. As the court summarized the uh, evidence, it showed that the defendant gave millions of dollars of HIE money to his girlfriend and millions of dollars to his wife without reporting any of this money on his personal tax returns. He siphoned off this money primarily by writing checks to employees and friends and having them return the cash to him, by diverting payments by HIE customers, by submitting fraudulent invoices to HIE, and by laundering HIE money through companies in the kingdom of Tonga, and Hong Kong. In defense, the defendant sought to introduce evidence that the corporation had no retained earnings or profits in the relevant tax years, which meant that the amounts diverted were non-taxable returns of capital, 
rather than taxable dividends. Thus, the defendant argued the government could not prove any tax deficiency, which is an element of tax evasion. Although a tax, division, uh, tax deficiency is not an element of filing a materially false tax return, the government agreed in that case that the tax evasion and false return charges were so closely interrelated that they should rise or fall together. The government filed a motion in limine to prevent the defendant from introducing evidence in support of this return of capital theory, arguing that it was irrelevant in a criminal tax case. Well, given what was characterized uh, as the defendant's colorful behavior, uh, non-tax practitioners may be surprised to learn that the Supreme Court unanimously reversed. Justice Souter began the opinion by reminding us that tax classifications like dividend and return of capital turn on objective economic realities of the transaction rather than the particular form the parties employed, and that a given result at the end of a straight path is not made different a different result by following a devious path. Well, that said, and having granted certiorari to resolve a split in the circuits, the Supreme Court rejected the rule prohibiting evidence of return of capital without evidence of a corresponding contemporaneous <coughs> intent as being inconsistent with the tax law's economic realism and with the particular wording of two sections in the Internal Revenue Code. Applied in the context of a criminal tax prosecution, even one with colorful allegations, the Supreme Court concluded that there is no criminal tax evasion without a tax deficiency, and there is no deficiency owing to a distribution if a corporation has no earnings and profits and the value distributed does not exceed the taxpayer shareholder's basis in the stock. Environmental Crimes, a case reported on page 21 and 22, U.S. versus Cooper. There the defendant operated what was described as a sewage lagoon for a trailer park, which was cited by the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality for over 300 violations during a five-year period. The violations were egregious, and after many notices and imposition of $17,000 in fines <coughs> resulted in revocation of the defendant's permit altogether. The offending conduct involved dumping of improperly treated sewage into a small creek in Virginia, which flowed into a larger creek, which flowed into the Roanoke River, and ultimately into North Carolina's Albemarle Sound. It is clear that the small creek into which the sewage was dumped is, under the law, a tributary of navigable waters, uh, as that term is defined in the Clean Water Act. Following conviction on nine counts of knowingly discharging a pollutant into waters of the United States, the defendant uh, raised two issues on appeal. First, he argued that the violation identified and cited by state regulatory authorities should have been excluded under federal rules of evidence 404B and 403. Um, to the contrary, the Fourth Circuit characterized this evidence as intrinsic to the story of the crime which does not fall under Rule 404B. And they also noted in the alternative that even if the evidence was within the ambit of 404B, that it would have been admissible to prove knowledge or mistake of absence of mistake or accident and not otherwise excludable under Rule 403 as unfairly prejudicial. The defendant also unsuccessfully argued that the government's proof failed to establish that he knew the waters into which he discharged pollutants were a tributary of a navigable water or adjacent to a navigable water or had a significant nexus to a navigable water, namely the creek. In rejecting this argument, the Fourth Circuit joined three of the four circuits which have addressed the issue by holding and held that the creek's status as a water of the United States is simply a jurisdictional fact the objective truth of which the government must establish, but the defendant's knowledge of which it need not prove. All right, a couple of sentencing uh, decisions. Uh, Cunningham versus uh, California, Supreme Court decision, 2000. There, the Supreme Court added to the sentencing jurisprudence began uh, in Apprendi versus New Jersey in 2000 and developed in uh, Blakely versus Washington in 2004 and United States versus Booker in 2005. I have recounted the holdings of those prior cases on the bottom of page 22 and top of page 
23. In Cunningham, the 2007 decision, the defendant was convicted of continuous sexual abuse of a child under the age of 14. Of course, this is not a white collar crime, but the holding is relevant to white collar <coughs> sentencing. Convicted of continuous sexual abuse of a child under the age of 14 under California's determinate sentencing law, which carried a 12 year term unless a judge found one or more aggravating factors. In that case, the judge in California found six aggravating factors and imposed a 16 year sentence. In an opinion written by Justice Ginsburg and joined by Chief Justice Roberts and Justices Stevens, Scalia, Souter, and Thomas, uh, definitely infrequent bedfellows, the 6-3 majority found a clear Sixth Amendment violation. They applied Apprendi, Blakely, and Booker and saw no distinction in the higher sentence based on judicial findings in, uh, in those cases and the higher sentence based on the judge's finding of an aggravating factor or more than one in Cunningham. A Fourth Circuit decision uh, contributing to the sentencing jurisprudence was U.S. versus Tucker, where, where the defendant had two prior fraud convictions. She was on supervised release for one of them when she pled guilty to a single count of bank fraud. As the evidence unfolded, a portion of the $77,000 she had embezzled from her employer in that case was used to pay restitution owed in connection with the two prior convictions. At sentencing, uh, Judge uh, Henry Herlong had had just about enough. He was unpersuaded uh, by the defendant's argument that she should be given a within guideline sentence, which was 24 to 30 months in that case, um, because she had, her reasons were she had suffered, she did suffer major depression, which stemmed from childhood abuse. Rather with the intention, as the judge put it, to fashion a sentence which will significantly keep her away from the public and describing her as a dedicated thief who apparently always will be, Judge Herlong imposed a 144 month or 12 year term of imprisonment. <coughs> Reviewing on appeal for reasonableness, the Fourth Circuit held first that some upward variance was warranted for the reasons articulated by Judge Herlong, but second, that the extent of the variance almost five times the upper end of the guidelines range was unreasonable. The court cited uh, four 2006 uh, Fourth Circuit decisions where it held variant sentences to be unreasonable, which are noted on pages 23 and 24 of your materials, but query whether these decisions are still good law after the Supreme Court decisions in Gall and Kimbrough, uh, both in 2007. I, would, I brought this issue of the champion uh, with me there's an excellent article on the Gall and Kimbrough decisions. This is the March, deci uh, March issue of the Champion, which is the publication of the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers on Gall and Kimbrough. Two decisions on downward departures in the time period covered. First, uh, U.S. versus Blatstein, where the defendant, the, this is the podiatrist case, uh, pled guilty to one count of mail fraud uh, relating to false claims he made for services he did not provide. Although a plea agreement recommended a 24-month sentence, Senior District Judge Richard Williams of the Eastern District of Virginia varied downward with no advance notice to the government and imposed a sentence instead of 12 months in one day. Judge Williams listed several reasons for the downward variance, including the defendant's early efforts to make amends for his wrongdoing, which the government contested. Uh, secondly, the effect of his offense on his health and profession, and the fact that a shorter prison term would save the United States $25,000 for that year of warehousing. Although the government offered substantive responses to Judge Williams' rationale for the lower sentence, the Fourth Circuit reversed on procedural grounds, namely the district court's failure to give the government reasonable notice of its ten intention to impose a variant sentence. As to what might constitute reasonable notice of an intention to depart, whether upward or downward, uh, a filing of a motion by either party is generally considered adequate, uh, as is a clear, focused recommendation in a pre-sentence report. However, uh, compare that to U.S. versus Spring, a 2002 Fourth Circuit decision noted on page 24 of your materials, which held that Rule 32's notice requirement was not satisfied where the district court's ultimate ground for departure was mentioned as one of several 
reasons for departure, and the court had never given notice that he that it was considering that particular ground. U.S. versus Balcom. Uh, this is the tax protester case I mentioned from our district. The district court departed downward based in part on the defendant's extraordinary charitable works. Uh, in reversing the sentence on multiple other grounds, which I've already noted, the Fourth Circuit commented that it was also troubled by the heavy reliance of the district court on the defendant's charitable works. Two decisions uh, in the period on upward departures and variances, reported beginning on page 25 of your materials, United States versus Dalton being the first. There the defendant pled guilty to a credit card fraud resulting in an approximate loss of $100,000. The pre-sentence uh, report calculated 15 criminal history points uh, for a criminal history category of six, placing the defendant in an advisory guidelines range of uh, 46 to 57 months. At sentencing, South Carolina District Judge David Norton found that the defendant had 23 potential additional criminal history points uh, that were not included in the score, determined that the criminal his history category 6 therefore did not adequately reflect the defendant's past criminal conduct or chances of recidivism and imposed a departure sentence of 105 months. The Fourth Circuit first agreed that some upward departure was reasonable, but concluded in light of the extent of the departure that the district court's failure to depart incrementally and its erroneous horizontal extension of the criminal history category rather than an incremental extension uh, was a reversible error. United States versus McClung, another upward departure or variance uh, opinion. There the defendant was West Virginia's assistant state superintendent of schools. During his tenure, he used his influence to channel state contracts to a friend who then returned approximately $400,000 in money and financial benefits uh, to him. None of these uh, payments were reported on his income tax return. The defendant pled guilty to one count of extortion under color of state right and one count of filing a false federal income tax return. The pre-sentence report calculated an advisory range of 51 to 63 months. The defendant argued for a sentence at the low end of the range or even for a downward departure. The government argued for a sentence at the high end of the range. At sentencing, without giving the defendant advance notice that he was considering an upward variance, District Judge uh, Joseph Robert Co uh, Goodwin imposed a sentence of 84 months. The defendant made two arguments on appeal. First, that the district court erred by failing to give advance notice of an upward departure uh, being considered. And secondly, that the sentence uh, 21 months above the high end of the advisory range was unreasonable. Because the defendant failed to make the first argument, that is the advance notice argument, uh, in the district court, it was reviewed only for plain error. The Fourth Circuit uh, concluded that it was plain error, but declined to notice the error, finding that it did not affect the defendant's substantial rights. The court also found <clears throat> the variant sentence reasonable in light of the reasons stated by the district judge, which included the duty uh, that the defendant owed as assistant state superintendent to every West Virginian. Secondly, that the defendant had created an elaborate, well-thought-out extortion scheme and ex which exploited his position of trust. And finally, that a variance sentence was necessary to promote respect for the law and to deter other public officials from dishonoring their offices uh, by sacrificing public interest to private gain. And the remainder of your materials are uh, addressing the, uh, something that I think that your sentencing commission speakers will uh, be spending a lot more attention and, and give better information about. But a, a brief summary of I under, what I understand to be the key not, uh, 2007 sentencing guidelines amendments, which went into effect November 1st of last year. Uh, only, um, I think, four of the seven areas directly apply or might apply to white collar cases, uh, beginning with the first, um, something that Art Beeler would be uh, uh, interested in here, the uh, reduction in term of imprisonment as a result of a motion by the director of Bureau of Prisons. Um, that was amended to specify four examples or circumstances uh, where uh, assuming the defendant or the then incarcerated individual is not a danger to the community or any person, 
which would constitute extraordinary and compelling reasons for a reduction in the sentence pursuant to Title 18, Section 3582C1A. That is a motion by the Director of the Bureau of Prisons to reduce the sentence of a person who has already been sentenced and is being incarcerated. Those four areas are where the defendant is suffering from a terminal illness, uh, second, where the defendant is suffering from a permanent physical or medical condition or is experiencing deteriorating physical, physical or mental health because of the aging process that substantially diminishes the ability of the defendant to provide self-care within the environment of a correctional facility and for which conventional treatment promises uh, no substantial improvement. Third, the death or incapacitation of the defendant's only family member capable of caring for the defendant's minor child or minor children. And fourth, where uh, as determined by the director of the Bureau of Prisons, there exists in the defendant's case an extraordinary and compelling reason other than or in combination with these other reasons to warrant a motion for reduction in sentence. All right. Um, the next area noted in the guidelines amendments that, that it would apply definitely to white collar cases is on page 29, and they have to do with the intellectual property guidelines. There, the amendment uh, essentially redefines infringement amount where a defendant is convicted of a violation um, of the trademark or copyright law, and the item in which the defendant trafficked was not a, an infringing item, but rather was an item intended to facilitate infringement. For example, a counterfeit label or documentation or packaging. The amendment uh, defines infringement amount as the retail value of the infringed item. Uh, it expands the sentencing enhancement to convictions for trafficking also in what are known as circumvention devices and provides potential relief to defendants convicted of these offenses by striking language mandating the upward adjustment in every case for abuse of position of trust um, or use of special skill, leaving it for determination on a case-by-case -case basis uh, that a downward departure may be appropriate where the calculation of infringement amount overstates the actual pecuniary harm to the copyright or trademark owner. So basically, it pushes the guidelines up in those kinds of cases and then gives a, a a license to bring it back down if the case uh, by case analysis uh, indicates that that is an appropriate thing to do. Page 30, uh, bottom of the page, I note the changes in the multiple counts uh, computation. Uh, guideline section 3D 1.1, application note 1, is amended uh, and provides now that for purposes of sentencing, multiple counts of conviction, counts can be grouped whether they are contained in a single indictment or information or contained in different indictments or informations uh, for which sentences are to be imposed at the same time or in a consolidated proceeding. And then the final change, again, that, that might apply in uh, white-collar cases are the changes to criminal history computation. There are two significant changes here uh, regarding the calculation of criminal history. The amendments uh, added and, in, uh, and amended provisions governing the counting of multiple prior sentences and materially changed the rules governing when misdemeanor and petty offense uh, convictions are counted in calculating criminal history. The latter will probably have the, the largest effect. Um, the changes to the counting of multiple prior sentences uh, were driven after uh, a series of meetings that the commission uh, hosted, uh, hearing from practitioners and, and academics, uh, the, the conviction being uh, a pretty strong cons consensus that the related cases rules, as they uh, were known, were just too complex, uh, that they had led to confusion. And the amendment, which was to guideline section 4A1.2A2, eliminated the related cases term or standard and substituted a single or separate sentences standard. That standard is described in your uh, materials on page 31, and those are the words of the Sentencing Commission. I found the explanation, frankly, a little confusing, but um, there she is. And the final uh, change uh, would be the uh, 
whether or not certain misdemeanors and petty offenses are included in determining criminal history. The uh, consensus, again, of these uh, convocations of practitioners and others was that counting of these sorts of convictions often resulted in an overstatement of a defendant's actual criminal history. Here, the Sentencing Commission made three modifications. First, uh, henceforth, fish and wildlife uh, violations and any local ordinance violation, which is not also a criminal violation under state law, will not be counted at all in the computation of criminal history. Uh, second, convictions followed by or on which uh, a one-year uh, probation, uh, one year of probation sentence is imposed are no longer going to be counted. The sentence has to be more than one year uh, for it to count. And third, the amendment uh, resolved a circuit conflict over the manner in which a non-listed offense is determined uh, to be counted or not counted or how to be counted, uh, substituting um, a similar to standard with a common sense standard, which the Fifth Circuit in the case cited here, United States versus Hardman, first articulated. We have a couple of minutes left, I think, uh, if there are any comments or questions. But only a couple. Anybody have it? Was it, were, were any of you involved in any of those those cases? In past years, I'll usually have somebody say that was someone was my case, and sometimes correct my analysis of it. Well, thank you all. One other administrative announcement before I introduce our next speakers. Uh, well, actually, two, two administrative announcements. First of all, you'll notice on this little handout that we gave you that the event today is sponsored by Nelson Mullins and also Gudger and Gudger PA. Uh, Lamar Gudger practices law in Asheville. I don't know if, if any of you know Butch, but he's a wonderful uh, guy and a wonderful friend of mine and a wonderful friend of, of Judge Everett's, and he is sponsoring the reception that we're going to have following uh, the presentation today. Is that going to be in the Birdman Lounge, Robin? Do you know? I'll, I'll ask. I'll find out where it's going to be. This law school's changed so much since I've taught up here, I'm not even sure. The other announcement, though, that I'm real pleased to make is that the brochure uh, was was printed up before I learned that Judge Everett had invited uh, a distinguished Duke alum, uh, Lawrence McMichaels, to speak to us on criminal forfeitures. Uh, Mr. McMichaels is practicing uh, attorney in Pennsylvania. Philadelphia. Yeah, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He's a Philadelphia lawyer, and he uh, he represents the Regis family who uh, had the Adelphia Communications Company that you may have read about in that in that side of the house, the criminal forfeiture side of the house. He's going to talk to us about that. We also have it's in Mr. Holter's on the program, uh, Mr. Herb Holter is going to speak to us about preparing sentencing uh, packages and helping people, helping attorneys and defendants and preparing their sentencing cases. So that's two very uh, good additions to our program, and I appreciate you gentlemen joining. When Judge Everett speaks, I listen. I'll put it that way. Uh, we also have another surprise speaker, uh, Jennifer Ahern, who is now with the U.S. Sentencing Commission. Jennifer is a 2004 graduate of Duke University. She, works, she worked with Pam Barron, uh, who is going to speak uh, next. But Pam has just this week been transferred or detailed, I think is the word she used, from the U.S. Sentencing Commission over to the Department of Justice, where she's working with the Assistant Attorney General uh, for civil, civil Rights. And so Pam's brand new in that job, and she's brought along a very able help. I've, Pam, this is Pam's third or fourth presentation here, too. Pam is the uh, deputy general counsel, well, I guess former deputy general counsel with the U.S. Sentencing Commission, and she clerked for me along the way. She was a, uh, uh, an Army judge advocate who used to argue before our court, and I asked her to join my staff, and she clerked for me for a couple of years before that. So, Pam, I'll turn the program over to you and Jennifer. Well, I'd like to thank Judge Everett for inviting me back and 
of course, to thank Judge Cox. It is such a pleasure to come back down here to Duke uh, and also to be on this panel with all of these distinguished uh, members. I'd like to introduce Jennifer A. Hearn. She is a staff attorney at the Sentencing Commission, and she's done a lot of research on the white-collar cases for this program. So what I'd like to do is give a little bit of a background about the Sentencing Commission and the sea change that uh, the Judge Horn mentioned with the Booker case, and then let Jennifer move into talking about what that impact is on white-collar cases. So I may move along a little bit quickly uh, to allow her to do that. But first off, I'd like to say, um, me, like to say happy birthday to Judge Everett and to let you know that it uh, was indeed my honor to uh, have my first appellate arguments before the Court of Military Appeals, before Judge Everett and then Judge Cox. And I can tell you that was quite, a, quite an event as a young JAG captain. So here we are many years later, and it's just a lovely association. Most of you know that there are probably about 73,000 cases a year in federal court, and 95% uh, of those cases plead guilty. So as they say, it's a game played between the 40-yard lines. It's a very much a sentencing game now since 95% of those cases are guilty pleas. About 34% of the cases were drug cases, 24% of the cases were immigration cases. That's a tremendous increase in immigration cases. 15% of them, though, are white-collar cases, so this is a very significant area of the law. And, of course, 10% of the cases are firearms, but today we're going to mostly concentrate just on those white-collar cases. Uh, I don't know how much you all know about the Sentencing Commission, but it's an agency up in Washington, D.C., in the judicial branch, first established in 1984 by the Sentencing Reform Act. And that act was actually uh, brought about by Senator Strom Thurmond and Senator Ted Kennedy. And it had several different aims. One of them was to um, provide uniformity of sentencing for federal crimes across the nation, saying that this is one system, so an individual convicted of fraud in Miami should get the same sentence as an individual convicted of fraud in New York City. And, um, basically looking to avoid unwarranted disparity. Now, there are obviously areas where you would have a departure. Perhaps somebody's done something very unusual, and it would take it outside of a heartland case. But basically, they were trying to get to a uniform system of law. And that went into effect pretty much in 1987. November 1, 1987 was when the guidelines were first effective. So let's see if I can get this to work. Our basic discussion today will be a little bit about the commission, a little bit about the guidelines, the impact of Booker, Rita Gall, Kimbrough, and then Jennifer's going to speak to you about these recent white collar cases. Uh, the commission is con it's formed by seven presidential appointees. Uh, right now, no more than four from one political party. We have three federal judges on the commission right now. Judge Ricardo Hinojosa from Texas, um, Judge William Sessions from Vermont, and Judge Castillo, who sits in Chicago. And then we have three attorneys, um, Dabney Friedrich, Beryl Howell, and Michael Horowitz. And we just recently um, lost, we have a vacancy now, we just lost uh, John Steer, who had been a vice chair at the commission and is a former general counsel of the commission, a very wonderful uh, lawyer and advocate for all these great sentencing issues. And he was a very big part of uh, the process of trying to get these guidelines situated. Um, Basically, the pre-guideline system at a glance, some of you all probably practiced in the pre-guideline system. I see a few people here who are probably very familiar with that. Um, in the pre-guidelines era, parole was in effect. So whatever time you received from the judge, um, an individual would be subject to parole, and the parole guidelines were being used to determine how much of a sentence a person actually ought to serve. Uh, there was some disparity in how those sentences were enacted, and Part of it was you didn't really know what factors judges were looking at in, in placing their sentence. Um, the goal of the Sentencing Reform Act was to create a little transparency, um, to sort of standardize what factors should be counted and how much they should be counted, what type of weight should they have. For example, if a gun is used in a robbery case and you didn't file a 924C, how much weight should it carry that that gun was used in a robbery? It should carry the same weight in Miami, in LA, in um, North Carolina. So that was part of the goal, to give, um, well, to give shape to how these sentencing factors played out. Um, how did that work? Well, we changed the system to create determinant sentencing. There would be no more parole. Parole was abolished. Um, good time was limited to 54 days a year. And the commission was created to develop these sentencing guidelines for all of these judges to employ. 
with the goal, again, of un avoiding unwarranted disparity. We just talked about the commission and how it's formed. It took a while for the guidelines to be fully implemented, and there were a number of challenges going up to the Supreme Court, and finally in Mistretta, the Supreme Court said that uh, Congress, of course, sets the statutory minimum and maximum, and basically the commission is just being delegated some uh, duties to cabin the judicial discretion within that mandatory, within that minimum and mandatory. So they found that there was no uh, violation of the separation of powers and no excessive delegation of authority. So the commission went to work, and it sat down and basically reviewed what sentencing judges had been doing. They looked at 100,000 cases. They looked at 10,000 pre-sentence reports and said, how do judges factor in the use of a gun in a robbery? How do they factor in the amount of loss in a fraud case? What are judges doing? And they tried to take that knowledge using a statute, 18 U.S.C. 3553A, which you're going to hear about, to come up with guidelines for judges to use. But these were mandatory guidelines. Well, the Sentencing Reform Act was very specific also about what the commission should come up with. They should come up with a sentencing table. And this table is just an example of how um, time in prison is expressed in months. And we have an axis going down, which is offense severity. And then we have an axis going across for criminal history. And where the two meet, you would have your guideline range. So here would be a guideline range of 21 to 27 months. Now, we have gentlemen here like Mr. Holter who uh, knows a lot about that. For example, I believe his client, Martha Stewart, was sentenced to a sentence here where she was able to have a split sentence, five months of this spent in prison and five months in home confinement. So these zones have meaning. Zone A, straight probation is allowed. Zone B and zone C allow some alternatives to incarceration. And then zone D is a straight imprisonment sentence. So that's sort of the quick nutshell of the guidelines. And then the earthquake occurred. And that was United States versus Booker, which Judge Horn has mentioned. Overnight, 20 years of guideline practice changed because suddenly the guidelines were no longer mandatory. It's so interesting that there were two opinions in this case. The substantive opinion was written by Justice Stevens. And he agreed with, the, uh, with, the, with Booker that it's a Sixth Amendment violation to have these findings of fact made by a judge with the preponderance standard of evidence. Basically, if you have an aggravating guideline factor, Justice Stevens said that needs to be proved to a jury or admitted by the defendant using the beyond a reasonable doubt burden of proof. Well, that really changed how the sentencing guidelines were set up. Now, Justice Stevens did also say that if the guidelines could be read as merely advisory, then you wouldn't have a Sixth Amendment violation. Well, Justice Breyer, who had been a sentencing commissioner on the original commission, which was chaired by Judge Wilkins of the Fourth Circuit, said, oh, well, then we can remedy that. We'll make them advisory. And he was able to do that by gaining the vote of Judge Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who happened to be in the majority of both the substantive and the remedial opinion. So the remedy was to strike the provision of the Sentencing Reform Act that made the guidelines mandatory. So now, the Sentencing Reform Act remains in effect for us, so we continue to gather data. We get five pieces of information from those 75,000 cases every year, and we take that data into a giant database to help us determine uh, what needs to be done with the guidelines, whether they need to be amended, whether Congress is giving us an order to increase them. It's called a directive. We have all of this data now. We continue to do that. But what do judges have to do with the guidelines? Well, since the Booker opinion, guidelines are guidelines. They're no longer mandatory. They're a benchmark that judges must consult. And then the appellate courts will review the judge's ultimate sentencing decision for reasonableness. Under 3553A, the court is to impose a sentence sufficient but not greater than necessary to comply with the purposes of sentencing, and the court shall consider the nature and circumstances of the offense, the history and characteristics of the defendant, and the purposes of sentencing, which are punishment, deterrence, incapacitation, and rehabilitation. So what does that mean for us? It means that you'll still receive pre-sentence reports, so that's where pre-sentence experts come in to help their clients. The statement of reasons has to be given so that an appellate court could see why the judge made the decision he made and so they can determine reasonableness. And of course, the documents on all those cases still come to the Sentencing Commission. 
so we can continue to monitor how this works. And we've taught the three-step approach, which means you continue to look at the guidelines and apply them, determine whether there's a departure element, and you heard uh, Judge Horn mentioned the, art, the Rule 32 requirement that you identify a departure ground. Some courts require that you also um, provide a variance ground. Other courts hold that departures and variances have pretty much merged. So there's a little difference of opinion on that. But basically, we're in a system now where uh, judges are still finding facts. The standard of proof is the preponderance of the evidence. Uncharged conduct can still come in, dismissed conduct, even acquitted conduct. There's no limitation on what a judge can consider if it uh, meets some minimum indicia of reliability to support its probable accuracy. The burden of persuasion falls on the party seeking an upward or downward adjustment. And as we know, the rules of evidence don't apply at sentencing. And what I'd like to do now is allow Jim to come up here and talk to you a little bit about what's happened with United States versus Rita and the rest of those cases that the Supreme Court has decided since we have become um, very much on their radar screen. Jen? Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone, and um, thanks to Judge Everett and Judge Cox. Um, it's a real, pl real pleasure for me to be back here, um, although I barely recognize parts of the law school now. Um, I'm going to try to talk about the most recent um, developments in the Supreme Court. As Pam said, there has been a lot of activity um, uh, recently, um, and uh, we've been busy. <laughs> and I've especially been busy because it's part of my job every day to um, read what the circuits are doing um, on all these issues and to update the commissioners on the latest action. So I read every circuit court opinion that comes down on sentencing issues every single day. <laughs> um, Rita. <laughs> Um, <coughs> review was granted in Rita not too long after Booker. Um, the courts of appeals found themselves in an interesting situation. I, I was clerking for a, a federal judge at the time, and we were sitting by designation with the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals when the uh, Booker decision came down. We had actually been assigned a sentencing opinion to write, and we had already heard oral arguments in the opinion when Booker came down. So naturally the question was, well, what do we do now? <laughs> um, obviously, this person was sentenced under mandatory guidelines. The court has said those are unconstitutional. Um, what do we do? And it turned out the answer was pretty practical from my judge. He said, I'm a district court judge. I'm sitting by designation. I'm not going out on any limbs, <laughs> and I'm not making any new law. So we're going to hold on and see what other people do. Um, eventually, the Fourth Circuit. <laughs> I, I hate to put it that way, but that's exactly what he told me. So I said, okay, judge, <laughs> I'm happy to do it. So the Fourth Circuit um, was one of the first circuits, actually, to, uh, to decide that. So after the Hughes decision was, uh, was announced, we followed their lead. The Sixth Circuit followed their lead. Um, so we disposed of our case that way. But it was a really interesting time to be, uh, to be in, the, in the courts of appeals. Um, as, as you'll notice up here, um, the courts of appeals during that time uh, developed a pretty a pretty significant split among them uh, regarding how appellate courts should be uh, reviewing these sentences that were imposed under an advisory system. Uh, a number of them decided that they would apply a presumption of reasonableness to within guideline sentences. So to the extent that a judge did sentence within the guidelines, uh, the courts of appeals essentially presumed that that sentence was reasonable, and the defendant or the government, whoever was challenging the sentence, had to overcome that presumption in order to have the sentence reversed. Other courts of appeals uh, declined to do that and concluded that that would be inconsistent with Booker. So they reviewed all sentences, either within or without the guidelines, similarly. Um, you'll see that. Um, I've got them listed up here. I'll note that the Ninth Circuit, which you'll see down here under not applying the presumption, um, actually did not speak on this issue officially until about two weeks ago. Um, they had two cases before them, Cardi and Zavala are the names of the defendants in those cases. Um, they, the panels ruled, and both of those cases were taken on banc um, several years ago now. And um, both of those cases were held, essentially, once the Supreme Court granted review in Rita and Claiborne, and then again when the Supreme Court granted review in Kimbrough and Gall. 
So the Ninth Circuit, who um, you might have expected to be out at the forefront of some of these issues, um, and certainly th they continue to rule on sentencing cases, but the particular issue of did they, do you apply a presumption or not, uh, they didn't speak to until essentially after the Supreme Court had already spoken on a number of these issues. So in Rita, uh, Victor Rita was a um, defendant here in the Fourth Circuit um, who was essentially, without getting into too many details, um, uh, indicted for an offense related to obstructing justice, um, falsely testifying in a, an investigation. And uh, he made a number of arguments uh, at sentencing involving issues related to his health, um, his safety in prison, other other, um, his status as a veteran, a few other things, um, asking the court essentially to impose a lower sentence than what the guidelines would have required. Um, the district court declined to do that and imposed a within guideline sentence, saying really not much in the way of explanation for why it decided to impose the within guideline sentence, um, and not, not really addressing the defendant's arguments for the below guideline sentence very, in, at great length. So uh, the defendant appealed, and the Fourth Circuit, again, in a very brief, I think, per curiam, unpublished opinion, um, affirmed that decision of the, of the district court to, um, to impose that within guideline sentence, saying, we presume that it's reasonable, no need to really say any more about it, reasonable. Um, the defendant then sought certiorari, and the Supreme Court granted certiorari, um, and said essentially what I've got the holding up here, which is that... Um, the Court of Appeals could apply such a presumption if it wanted to, um, but it didn't have to. And the Supreme Court upheld that sentence. So in one fell swoop, it essentially resolved this circuit split, but didn't tell any circuits that they were doing anything particularly wrong. Um, interesting. At the same time, the court had granted review in another course, United States, another case, United States versus Claiborne. Uh, Mr. Claiborne was a defendant who was convicted of a crack cocaine offense, and um, the issue was whether the district court could take into consideration the 100 to 1 ratio. I'm not sure how familiar all of you are with the crack cocaine um, laws, but essentially it takes 100 times as much powder cocaine to receive the same mandatory minimum sentence as crack cocaine. So the drug weights, it's a 100 to 1 ratio to get that mandatory minimum. So the question was, this has a, been a pretty controversial thing. The commission has done many, I think, four or five reports to Congress on this, and it's, it's been a very contentious issue ever since the mandatory minimums were instituted. Um, and uh, a lot of judges would like to take that into account, have indicated that they would like to take that into account when they're sentencing crack defendants. So the question was, may the judge do that? Um, Mr. Claiborne's case was heard before the Supreme Court, but he died before they were able to actually rule on it. So, as a result, um, the court granted certiorari in another crack case, Kimbrough versus United States. Um, at the same time that they granted review in Kimbrough, they also granted review in Gall versus United States, which is a case out of the Eighth Circuit where the defendant, it was also a drug case, um, but the defendant in that case was pretty, I think, unique among, um, among meth defendants. Um, he was... He was involved in a meth ring while he was a college student. Um, involved for a relatively brief amount of time, a couple of months maybe. Um, he withdrew from the conspiracy. He stopped selling the drugs, um, graduated, moved out of state. And a number of years later, four or five years later, um, the government uh, received evidence another way about the conspiracy and indicted him uh, for his participation in this conspiracy. And the district judge, um, sentenced him to probation um, when, I, I forget exactly what his guideline range would have been, oh, 30 to 37 months. So that was a, that was a big, big variance um, from 30 to 37 months down to zero months imprisonment. Um, and the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals overruled that sentence and said it was simply too big a variance um, and that that was unreasonable under Booker. So he sought certiorari before the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court granted certiorari and um, held that the Eighth Circuit could not review this under, below the guideline or variance sentence or non-guideline sentence any differently than it would review a within guideline sentence, could not apply a more strict standard to that sentence than it applied to a 
within guideline sentence. So abuse of discretion is the standard of the day now. After Gaul, abuse of discretion is the standard. Essentially, reasonableness and abuse of discretion kind of mean the same thing. So that, that is the, um, the court's interpretation of its previous holding in Gaul. Um, so that's the latest action from the Supreme Court. Um, another case that is about to go before the court um, is the issue of notice, which Pam talked about. Um, may the court, when you get, show up to sentencing, say, oh, by the way, I think I'd like to go down to probation. Or, oh, by the way, I'm going to give you five times the top of the guideline range. Um, in before Booker, um, there was a pretty set rule on this because the only way you were really going to go down or up was a departure. So there was a set procedure that was sort of worked out. Um, after Booker, the question was, well, what do you do with the variance? Does that same rule apply to variances the way that it de applied to departures before Booker? Um, there's a split among the circuits. You can see I've listed them up here. And um, the court granted certiorari to essentially rule on this issue. Um, and that argument will be held in a couple of weeks. So we'll see what, what comes of that um, is coming up. So. Um, what position is the solicitor general taking? Uh, I think that, that that notice is required. Um, for variances and departures. That no notice yes. is, or that no. I'm sorry. What what position? That that the notice would be required it is for required. both. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, okay. So now, I'm, unless there are other, are there any other questions on any of that? I, I moved through it pretty quickly because it's not necessarily entirely germane to white collar, although it applies in all cases. So um, it could come up. Okay. Um, I'm going to move on to talk about just a few recent white collar cases that um, are not notable. And I think as we work through them, you'll see that, um, that they demonstrate the variety of, of possible outcomes in these cases. Most of them are pretty high profile cases. Um, and you'll see some long sentences and you'll see some probationary sentences. So it will be very interesting as sort of a microcosm of guideline issues to actually see where all, what factors go into reaching which conclusion. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit at length about Jamie Olis, um, who I'm sure some of you have heard about, um, of Dynegy Corporation, um, because I think his case points up, and I'm, I'm sure, Mr. Michael, you're going to talk about this, um, his case points up one of the big issues um, in the white collar area right now, which is the issue of loss and the impact of loss <coughs> on uh, the length of the sentence imposed. Um, the 2B11 guideline has a table essentially inside of it that um, that lists the amount of money that was lost and then specifies how many guideline levels you go up based on that amount of loss. So, um, and the numbers are large, um, <coughs> pretty large. So um, you'll see, and we'll, we'll go through Mr. Olis and you'll see that there's, they're going to have a big impact on, um, on the sentence. So Jamie Olis, um, convicted of securities fraud, mail fraud, wire fraud. Um, the court noted that the most significant determinant is the loss calculation um, and determined that the guideline range um, as it was would be 360 months to life, which is the longest sentence, I mean, other than pure life, is the longest sentence that you could actually receive under the guidelines. Um, so his, the initial calculation um, that the court did was, and this is how we got here. The base offense level under 2B11 <laughs> is six. So for any, any case that, um, that you use 2B11, you start with six. Um, 26 levels increase for a loss greater than $100 million. Um, four level increase for uh, more than 50 victims. Two level increase for use of sophisticated means, which typically means in these cases something like um, you set up a a complicated scheme to um, hide something on your balance sheet or use a, a complicated accounting technique, something, something like that. Um, similarly, use a special skill. Um, if you're an accountant or you're a lawyer, something like that, you can oftentimes be hit with that enhancement as well. Um, so this b brought him on the sen sentencing table that Pam talked about earlier, offense level 40, those are the ones that go down. Um, and then he was a criminal history category one because I think he had no criminal history probably. So that took you all the way down to the bottom of that side of the table, 292 to 365. So the court, this was pre-Booker, imposed the bottom of the guideline range 
292 months. Um, the Fifth Circuit um, took this case on appeal and, um, oh, well, okay, before we get there, um, the Fifth Circuit, we'll note that 2B11 says you consider, when you're determining loss, you consider either the actual loss that was caused by the fraud or whatever the white collar crime was, or the intended loss. So how much did the defendants actually intend to profit from their criminal activity? Um, the issue of proving that is difficult. Um, and the guidelines don't necessarily contain a lot of guidance in terms of how do you determine what this loss is. Um, the Fifth Circuit found essentially that um, that you should import the civil damages measure from, as discussed in the Supreme Court's case, Dura Pharmaceuticals, um, because it furnishes the standard of compensable injury for securities fraud victims, and it's attuned to stock market complexities. So the idea is, let's get at what's the reality of the loss that was caused by this particular case. Rather than trying to come up with a very simplistic way of figuring out loss, let's try to get at what the real loss is in that situation. Um, the, so back on, when, it, when the case came back down to the district court, the district court essentially um, looked at the expert testimony that was presented to it and determined that the experts in the case for the government simply hadn't proven this actual loss in any way, hadn't calculated in any way that the court could rely on to determine what loss, it, loss was. So, here, so I, I've got this quote up here. Um, there's no loss attributable to a, to a misrepresentation unless and until the truth is revealed and the price of the stock declines. Where the value declines for other reasons, however, that decline is not a loss attributable to the misrepresentation. So the court was trying to get at, let's look at the stock price. We can, we can measure what, whether the stock price goes up or down, but what we want to find out is why and what caused that increase or decrease, usually decrease, um, and did it come simply from, gee, the news got out that this guy was caught hiding things on the balance sheet or whatever, cooking the books in whatever way he was cooking them. Um, and we want to figure out what impact did that particular crime have as opposed to the market in general was going up or down or there was other economic bad news that came or there was a different thing going on with that particular company that caused the, caused the stock price to go down, even if it was unrelated to this fraud itself. So. Um, the district court concluded that it could not estimate with any degree of reasonable certainty the actual loss that the fraud caused. And so instead it looked at the intended loss, which it did have evidence of. Um, it had evidence of the plan that they essentially concocted to, um, to perpetrate the fraud and how much money they wanted to get out of it. So instead it went with that figure because it concluded that the testimony was reliable enough to give it a reasonable, a degree of reasonable certainty that that was the intended loss. So $79 million instead of more than 100. So we'll look at his new guideline calculation. Um, base offense level six, again, we start there. 24 levels, um, and then two for sophisticated means, two for use of special skill. Um, the, you'll, you might remember the um, more than 50 victims enhancement that we talked about. Um, the court found again that that was related to the issue of being able to prove what the impact on the stock price was. That <coughs> that more than 50 victims represented all the shareholders, but if you can't prove the relationship between the fraud and the actual cost to the shareholders, you can't really prove that there were more than 50 victims. So um, <coughs> we got rid of that enhancement, so now we have offense level 34. Again, criminal history category one, 151 to 188 months. So that was down from 292 previously. A pretty significant decrease um, just, on, just based on this issue with loss and how you actually calculate the loss. Um, the court then decided, then, since this is after Booker, the court then talked, um, examined and discussed the 3553A factors that Pam talked about as now that the guidelines aren't mandatory, the court has to consider all of these various 3553A factors. So um, I'm going to walk through just briefly how the court um, analyzed those factors in Mr. Olis's case. Um, 
The court said that the charges were serious, but noted that the defendant did not have the <coughs> ultimate responsibility of approving the fraudulent acts, um, and also seemed to be, seemed to think it was very important that um, the purpose was not to defraud the company or to enrich the defendant himself. Um, and also thought it was important that the company actually didn't go under, um, unlike, for example, maybe Enron, where um, you have the defendants in those cases who not only enriched themselves but also caused the bankruptcy of their company. Um, Dynagy continued to be a viable company after, um, after the fraud, even though the stock price dropped dramatically. Um, the court looked at the history and characteristics of the defendant, which um, is a very broad category. I'm not sure. Um, how clear it is just from that language, um, but the court looked at uh, the defendant's childhood, um, the difficulties that he had had there. Um, I believe his, his father had abandoned him and his mother when he was younger. Um, he had to immigrate to this country. He'd overcome a language barrier, a number of very personal characteristics to the defendant um, that the court, the court looked at. Um, and the court also looked at the fact that um, it received a number of letters and looked at his charitable work and concluded that other than the offense, he had led an exemplary life. Um, the court determined that um, a significant term of imprisonment was necessary, um, but concluded that essentially it could go below the guideline range, still impose a significant term of imprisonment, and that that term of imprisonment would be substantial and would be sufficient to actually um, accomplish the purposes of sentencing. One really interesting thing about this that the court said um, about deterrence, and I think this is, um, this is something that, uh, you know, um, with the Sarbanes-Oxley and, and Congress really acting in this area, I think this is an interesting um, statement by the court um, regarding general deterrence. Deterrence is one of the 3553A factors, both general deterrence, i.e. deterring everybody out there, and specific deterrence meaning deterring this particular defendant from committing a crime again. Um, but with respect to general deterrence, the court said, the media has reported on lengthy sentences received by a number of white-collar defendants. And the court was persuaded, so we presume persuaded by the defendant, um, that potential white-collar criminals have become aware of the substantial risk of imprisonment and that a long sentence in this case is not necessary to provide general deterrence. <laughs> so. Um, with respect to that factor, the court decided that a below-guideline sentence would still be sufficient to provide that general deterrence um, for future white-collar criminals or people who are considering becoming white-collar criminals. <laughs> Aspiring white-collar criminals? I'm not sure. <laughs> um, with respect to specific deterrence, uh, the court essentially said, we don't really need to send this guy to prison to specifically deter him because he was such a high up guy and the fact that he's been brought so low, lost his license, all these other things, um, will provide adequate deterrence for him essentially not getting involved in something like this again. <coughs> I think that's pretty common in white collar cases. I think the courts have often looked at that issue and, and can come to that conclusion. Um, um, these are some other things. Uh, so. That was Mr. Olis's case. I think it, um, it, it gives you a pretty good insight into a lot of the issues that, that will come up in white collar cases um, and, and gives you the court's thinking on, on how those factors weigh in, um, in this guideline range, especially where um, the loss figure is so important that the court is going to, to really look at, um, look at these other, other issues. So um, I, think I, went, I lost a slide here. Well, there should be a slide here that says um, the court varied down to 72 months for Mr. Olis. So that was his adjusted um, guideline range was 151 months, the bottom of the guideline range. So the court varied downward below that to 72 months in his case and determined that that amount of imprisonment was adequate to <coughs> serve all these purposes of sentencing. So um, I'm going to move pretty quickly through a few other notable white collar sentences. Um, this one would be Gregory Reyes, who was the CEO of Brocade Communications um, out in California. Um, there was a, a task force established within the U.S. Attorney's Office out there to um, look into this concealing of the backdating of stock options. 
Um, that kind of came about. I think a lot of um, a lot of attention was paid to that after Enron and Sarbanes Oxley kind of looked at those issues. Um, and so Mr. Reyes was the first see, first person to be indicted by this task force um, for the uh, concealing this backdating. Um, he, his guideline range, as you'll see up here, was 15 to 21 months, um, and uh, the court sentenced him at the top of the range. Um, the United States, in that case, sought the guideline rate, sought um, 30 to 33 months, and a 41 million dollar fine, um, which the court obviously declined to make those findings and uh, and sentenced him to, but sentenced him to the top of the guideline range. And um, if you if you read about the um, read about the sentencing, the court at sentencing actually said, you know, I'm imposing this um, in order to send a message to corporate America that this concealing of backdating is not appropriate, and um, I, find, I see this as a crime of dishonesty, and um, I think it can have a wide impact on the shareholders, the investors, the people <coughs> whose pensions are tied up in these companies, and um, I really see this as my opportunity to send a message to them that this is a very serious offense. So um, one way that the court did that, other than simply saying it, was imposing the top of the guideline range um, in this case. Um, also, we have Mr. Coughlin, um, who fraudulently misappropriated some Walmart funds. Um, he was convicted of, um, of wire fraud, filing false tax returns. Um, the guideline range in his case was 27 to 33 months imprisonment. Um, the court instead pro um, um, imposed probation with 27 months of home confinement as a condition of this probation. Um, this was obviously a variance from the guideline range. There was no departure that would get you. Um, you remember Pam showed you the, the chart and there was zone D where you can't get probation. Well, 27 to 33 months is definitely in zone D. Um, but the court in this case decided to vary downwards and impose the probationary sentence. Um, the court wrote a very lengthy sentencing opinion in this case. Um, and actually, the procedural part of it was a little odd because he was originally sentenced before Gaul, and the Eighth Circuit sent, uh, remanded the sentence as unreasonable before Gaul. And then Gaul came down and had sort of a chain impact on exactly how much review and all of that. So the court was really struggling with what was the impact of Gaul in this particular case, given that the Eighth Circuit decision in its case had come before Gaul. So it was a little tricky, but. Um, essentially, the court imposed the same sentence that it imposed before when it got reversed, but it did so on the basis of a variance instead of the basis of a departure. Um, and it wrote at length about um, the embarrassment that being indicted and being convicted would cause to the defendant's family, talked about um, there was going to be a public library named after his wife and how they had now taken that away and they weren't going to name it after him anymore. Um, talked about his charitable contributions <laughs> over time. Um, talked about health concerns, um, that he had heart problems, um, kidney stone, some other physical impairments. And that was a big issue before the Eighth Circuit. In fact, um, in the first case, the Eighth Circuit actually split on that issue of whether he actually did have an extraordinary physical impairment. So his, his health was a big issue in this, um, in this situation. But um, essentially, the court, uh, the district court really emphasized the language from Gaul, which said, probation is a serious, a serious thing to impose on someone. It's not nothing. Imposing a pro probationary sentence is not the same as imposing no <coughs> sentence. Um, and so they really relied on that to impose probation here. Yes? Which of his houses was he confined to? <laughs> <laughs> they didn't say, <laughs> interestingly. <laughs> so I'm not sure. Um, they did impose. 1,500 hours of community service as well. So I'm sure he was busy. Um, and um, we'll talk about these, these guys briefly as well. This is pretty interesting. Um, the major two sentences that we're going to talk about um, in this case, and this is all related, the, the Hollinger Media um, Company uh, owns a number of newspapers, and um, essentially uh, they were 
I think I didn't entirely I don't entirely understand still the scheme, but um, apparently there were some payments that were hidden um, to the principals in the company um, by uh, a non compete um, non compete compensation that was so there were agreements drafted that they wouldn't compete and that they would be compensated for not doing so. Um, so they had an attorney um, that would be Mr. Kipnis who actually drafted these agreements. Um, at the behest of the principals of the company. Um, and this ended up stealing a lot of money and, um, and causing a lot of problems for the company and for the, the papers that were owned by the company. Um, so Conrad Black, um, I'm sure we've all known him. He's a very colorful, um, he was a colorful defendant. Um, he was the CEO and he received uh, 78 months imprisonment. Um, that was, uh, we understand, the bottom of the guideline range. Um, the judge in this case did not um, publicly release a sentencing memorandum explaining her guidelines calculations, which judges don't actually are not actually required to do. They have to submit to the sentencing commission their um, their calculations, but they don't actually have to publish anything in the record. They have to state it at the sentencing, but they don't actually have to publish anything written where you could go into Westlaw, say, and look up where did the judge go with this? You, they don't actually have to do that. And the judge in this case did not do that. So um, what we know about how her thinking on his sentence is not, not as clear as it could be um, if we saw something like that. But we know he got the bottom of the guideline range, but that she declined to impose any sort of variance or any sort of departure down from there. So um, I think it was considered to be a pretty significant sentence for him, um, that even though it was the bottom of the guideline range, that, that this term of imprisonment was considered pretty significant. Um, there were two other people that were sentenced at the same time that were um, also executives, um, Atkins and um, Boltby, I believe the, the gentleman's name was. They received 24 and 27 months respecti respectively. So um, they received a slightly lesser sentence. The really interesting part um, came when the judge was to sentence Mr. Kipnis. Um, as I said, he was the attorney um, who drafted these agreements at issue. And um, the guideline range <coughs> for him was 30 to 37 months. But the judge instead imposed no prison. Um, yes, I heard a wait. No, okay. Um, the judge imposed no prison, 60 months of probation, and six months home detention. Um, and the reports from the sentencing were really interesting because um, the judge received a lot of information um, on this defendant that maybe she didn't receive. She wouldn't have have um, received from others. For example. Um, the defendant's wife and son testified at the sentencing hearing um, about what the impact of his going to prison would be on them. Um, they noted that um, since he had lost his law license, they had bought a sign company and were trying to make the sign company viable and were struggling to get along, essentially. Um, and the judge said that she was moved by this testimony. Um, the judge also noted that she received, and this I thought was really interesting, she received a petition from, signed by a couple of hundred of the employees of the newspaper that was owned by the Chicago Sun-Times, that was owned by this Hollinger Media. So essentially, you could think of them as sort of victims, in a way, in the sense that the harm that was done to this company um, impacted their ability to feel safe in their jobs, probably caused some people to lose their jobs, and generally caused a lot of trouble for the paper. That, but all of these people came together and signed a petition um, st stating that they didn't think that this guy should go to prison, that, that they liked him, that they thought that he was an honest guy. And um, the judge apparently found that to be a very significant um, and um, really uh, took that into account in determining whether she thought he ought to go to jail or not. So um, you see, you can see in in the range of these sentences of just these last four guys that I've talked about, that the judge seems as though she tried to come to some understanding of who is the most culpable and who is the least culpable and to make their sentences really conform to her understanding of that hierarchy, if you will. Um, and that th these are the ways that, that she went about doing that. So um, those were some, some pretty interesting cases. Um, and I think I'm gonna turn it over to Pam to go back over the data, is that right? Well, actually, the data is a part of your material, oh, okay. so we might want to go ahead and take a break. Okay, perfect. All right, and if anyone else has a question, I'm happy to answer it, or you can come up to me, but otherwise I'm done. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.
take about a 10 minute break and when we come back one other announcement mr alexander is not going to be able to join us today he had a client so we're going to cut the the three o'clock program a little bit short so we give the extra time to judge everett and his back